All right. Welcome everybody to this year's last installment of the Chalmers AI for Science seminar. So this is a seminar series hosted at Chalmers um, where we invite excellent young, uh, young and medium, uh, so junior and medium career researchers at the interface of AI, machine learning and the natural sciences to present the research that they have ongoing in their labs. So today we have the pleasure of introducing Tess Smith. Uh, she's an assistant professor at the electrical engineering and computer science departments at MIT. She earned her B, uh, SB at, in physics from MIT and uh, later went on to do a PhD at UC Berkeley where she graduated in 2018. Her research focuses on machine learning that incorporates physical geometrical constraints um, and, and, with, and with applications specifically in materials design. Before joining the MIT uh, e e Electrical Engineering and Computer Science faculty, she was an uh, Alvarez postdoctoral fellow at, uh, in, in computing sciences at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and a software engineer intern at Google Accelerated Sciences team. She's, uh, she, she's been an important uh, developer of, the, uh, of neural network uh, libraries for Equivera neural networks, um, and they have been broadly adopted. And so she's already in her relatively short career made extremely important contributions to the scientific community. And so we are very excited to have her here today. So please, um, Tess, take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction, Simon. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be able to share uh, some of my work with you today. So I'll do the classic check for, can you see my slides? Yep. Great, perfect. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, if you are interested in following along, I do have a tiny URL here. So tinyurl.com slash test dash Chalmers dash 2022. Um, and all these things are links to papers that I'm going to reference. I have the absolute pleasure of presenting work done by not only myself, but a talented, very talented group of researchers that I get to show off today. Um, so if you're interested in following those papers more closely, those links are here. And so what I'm going to do is kind of take you through um, kind of a broad overview of sort of what's the motivation behind building symmetry into neural networks? Um, what are we actually able to do with these neural networks? And what are some of the things that we kind of didn't expect, but seem to be true about these neural networks? Additionally, um, I'm going to encourage folks, especially because this is remote, to please ask questions during the talk, either through the chat um, or otherwise. So I'll pause at different points during the talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, so all right, let's get started. So let's say that we want to apply machine learning to physical systems. And often when we're trying to describe a physical system to a computer, we need to use a coordinate system. We need to tell basically the computer, where things are in 3D space. And to do this, we you know, can have any choice of coordinate system. So let's say I have an arrangement of atoms here in these benzene molecules. And I could describe these atoms with coordinates of system one or of system two. Now, it's the same physical system, but I'm describing it very differently. The numbers that I write down and give to my computer will be very different. We always have this freedom to choose our coordinate system. And in the case of 3D space, we can transform between them using the symmetries of 3D space. So 3D rotations, 3D translations, and inversion, which is what gives rise to things like mirror symmetries. Now, the problem is that traditional machine learning sees these as completely different. I show it one, I show it two. It's like, these are absolutely not related. Uh, and this is unfortunate because we wanna do a lot of difficult things with machine learning and coordinate systems are pretty basic. So how bad is this problem? Well, in 2D, um, you probably have seen how folks in computer vision might take images of cats and dogs and kind of rotate them maybe tenfold. And that seems to be good enough, or it just kind of learns um, through natural data augmentation of the data set. In 3D, this gets substantially worse. So instead of tenfold augmentation, we need about a 500 fold. Uh, so this means a lot more training, a lot more parameters, and you don't have the guarantee that it actually understands that a rotated object just means the same thing. It's just rotated. So, you know, just to kind of um, 
emphasize the point, you know, if I'm training and I don't have a model, for example, built with rotational symmetry, and I want it to understand that this cube is the same thing, or at least should lead to similar outputs, um, I have to train on a lot of things versus training with symmetry. I show it one and I'm done. So much simpler and also more robust and you have further guarantees. Okay, so traditional machine learning sees these as completely different. And we would like methods that see one and two as the same system, but described differently. These are kind of distinct descriptions. So we would like machine learning that has symmetry built into it. So there's two broad approaches for this problem. Um, one is to say, well, I'd like to still use sort of regular neural networks, or I don't wanna you know, complicate my method too much. And I'm gonna use an invariant model so it's going to operate on invariant features, features that don't depend on my choice of coordinate system, things like relative distances, bond angles, things like this um, that don't change with my coordinate system. And I'm just going to operate on that. And that is an extremely good way to go about things. And there's a lot of um, there's a rich body of work uh, exploring these ideas and also trying to find bounds for when can invariant models um, sort of exactly approximate what you're trying to do. So that's one approach. Um, but there's also equivariant models, which basically recognize and keep around the coordinate system. And if your coordinate system changes, the outputs will change accordingly. So you're not stuck with only predicting invariant features. You can also predict things like higher order tensors and matrices. So it's a bit more rich of a space. So what's the catch? Um, you know, if equivariant methods, you know, can can kind of keep the, around the coordinate system and, and have these rich outputs, um, what's the catch? And the fact is that equivariant models are more complex than invariant models. And to kind of demonstrate this, let's go through a little bit of an exercise. So how do I interact to invariant objects? So invariant objects do not change with the choice of coordinate system. They're just numbers, things like mass um, or even charge. Uh, these are scalar invariant objects. So if I have a number times a number, I just get back a number. Okay, well, how about we have a little bit more of a complex object. I have a 3D vector. A 3D vector, it does change with the coordinate system. But if I multiply it times a number, all it does is scale the vector. It doesn't change the directional information. So these are sort of invariant interactions, even when they involve something that is equivariant, something that changes with the coordinate system in a predictable manner. Now, how do we interact? equivariant objects, well, what we have to use are called geometric tensor products. So if I have these two vectors, the most general way to interact them is to take the outer product. And inside the outer product, there's actually three sort of more fundamental objects hiding in there. So other ways that you can interact vectors is like the dot product, which is actually the trace of the matrix. There's also the cross product, which is the anti-symmetric component of the matrix. And then what you have remaining is this very highly symmetric, symmetric traceless component of the matrix um, that is also there and plays a very important role. Um, so this is just to give you a flavor for the fact that when you're dealing with equivariance, your multiplication operation actually changes. So anytime you multiply objects in a model, whether it be a neural network or anything else, this has to change. So I'm gonna pause there and see if we have any questions. All right, I'm guessing no questions, so I will keep going. But if they come up, definitely ask them. There is a there is a question. Oh, there is a question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, in the chat, you're saying. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, would you mind reading it to me? I, I know sure. I, I have tried reading chats while giving talks. Sure, 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 sure. Sorry. I end up usually exiting out of everything. <laughs> okay. So uh, Shana Vas asks if the is the auto product everything that can be done here, or is there something else? Um, as far as I'm aware of, at least for the groups that I'm considering, uh, the outer product is the most general. Okay, and then there's somebody who's asking to what the relationship to DimeNet is, if, if that's something that is... Uh... Okay, I have to remember specifically, I think DimeNet has, and I might be getting this confused with another network. Um, I've definitely read the DimeNet paper, but now I'm just confusing with something else. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, it has um, things like bond angles, maybe dihedrals, like it has different body orders, but they are all invariant objects. 
And so I don't go into body order in this talk, but it's the notion that you can have features um, in a model that not only belong to sort of like one atom, if we are taking kind of a chemistry context, it can belong to sort of a set of atoms and even a set of atoms in a particular order. And so that can be the body order. Um, and so that has to do more with, I believe Diamond is also kind of in the graph neural network paradigm. Um, and so I believe then the issue there is sort of deciding how these different body order objects are going to interact with each other. And that's a permutation symmetry issue, uh, not a rotational symmetry issue. So it's still, still important, still very important. Um, but if I'm remembering correctly, I think that's the difference. Great, I think we can move on. Thanks, Jess. Great, thanks for the question. And also if I got that completely wrong, I apologize to the DimeNet authors and I, I will remind myself uh, the specifics of that paper afterward. <laughs> okay, so at a high level, why limit yourself to functions that have symmetry? And one of the main reasons is that you can substantially constrain the function space that you're looking over. So if I have like all learnable functions, which kind of general neural networks promise me, they're universal approximators. You know, this is a very huge space. Um, but if I'm doing something, especially in the physical sciences, I don't really want to learn like any function. I don't want to learn like, you know, um, how many angels on the head of a pin lead to, you know, quantum electrodynamics or something, you know, it's like there's certain functions I just don't, don't want to learn. That's not in the context of what I want to learn. So if I have all the learnable functions that obey a specific symmetry, such as Euclidean symmetry in this talk, uh, that space is much smaller. And so it's making your data more powerful. Basically, you get to learn more from each example. And we'll show kind of more concretely, like, how does that actually affect things? Um, so rather than all learnable functions constrained by your data, you actually have this much smaller space of functions. And you're more likely to find more robust and generalizable solutions. Why not do um, other, like, go even further and say, I'm going to just restrict myself to invariant functions? And this can be possible. It could be that you don't need an equivariant function, but you just need an invariant one. But the trick here is that you need to ensure if you needed to compute any outer products or cross products or dot products, if you needed to do that beforehand in order to get certain invariant quantities necessary to do your, your invariant function, you have to make sure you did that beforehand. So, so there's kind of no going back. Once you start using an invariant method, um, you really hope that you already had any equivariant interactions that you already needed. Um, so that's kind of the trade-off. So like all learnable equivariant functions is bigger than the space of invariant functions. And you can end up a situ in a situation where given the data that you have, the inputs and the outputs, it may not be possible to actually learn a invariant function that gets you where you need to go. Um, or you might be on the border where it's like you kind of can approximate it, but maybe you're also kind of on the side uh, that it would have been better or more efficient, more computationally efficient for a neural network to sort of learn um, the information using equivariant functions versus invariant. Or you might be solidly um, kind of in invariant function land. So these are kind of different situations you can end up in. So for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about um, Euclidean neural networks and any type of method that is Euclidean symmetry equivariant has Euclidean symmetry built into the model. And this means that the method understands that a system described by different or a system that's described by different coordinate systems still means the same thing. And it understands that even without training. So this is not part of the training procedure. This is part of how the model is actually built from the ground up. Um, but if you do train it, um, there are many nice properties. So for example, let's suppose I have a water molecule and I'm just rotating it. And this is a, looks like a fairly simple rotation. We can kind of intuitively say, okay, yeah, that's a 3D rotation of a water molecule. This is the Hamiltonian for this water molecule computed with density functional theory. Uh, so it is a complex tensor where we have basically electrons on different atomic orbitals interacting with one another. And the thing I want to show here is just that this is pretty intuitive to see these transformations. This is much less intuitive. Things are changing rapidly, um, and they're changing at different frequencies for different parts of this matrix. This is a much more complex object. Uh, and the nice thing is that if you have Euclidean symmetry built in, you show it one example, it will be able to um, make this prediction in any orientation automatically. So you can see how this might allow your model to not have to learn rotation and instead focus on, on the really hard problem, which is learning quantum mechanics. 
So furthermore, just to kind of give some more examples to make this more concrete, um, I work a lot with crystal systems. And the way we describe crystals are with these things called unit cells, which is basically a box. You put atoms in the box and then you tile the box in 3D space. And there is no unique way to represent a crystal. They're just sort of a useful tool that we use to communicate what a crystal is in different circumstances. So this is all silicon. Um, and this silicon crystal, the smallest, one of the smallest ways to describe it is in this unit cell, although there's many other smallest unit cells. This is sort of the conventional unit cell. And this is a supercell. And what's nice is that if you have a symmetry equipped method, you can give either or any of these and you're guaranteed to get the same answer or the appropriate answer. Um, so it understands it's the same system. It's just presented differently. Furthermore, if you want to predict forces on a molecule, you're guaranteed to predict the same forces, even if that molecule is rotated. Um, additionally, you're going to be able to generalize well to molecules that might have similar subgroups or similar motifs and patterns. Um, even furthermore, like in a crystal setting, you often have kind of these coordination environments. So in this one, rubidium, this rubidium manganese chloride crystal has a manganese atom octahedrally coordinated by chlorine atoms. And these two motifs, they are the same, but they are oriented relative to each other. So you'll simultaneously be able to identify this is the same motif, but you'll be sensitive to the fact that their relative orientation is different. And this is very advantageous for especially a lot of crystal properties. Okay, so this is a good point for me to pause again and see if there's any questions before I talk about some of the applications that we've done. Yeah, so I have a question about this. So you, you were saying that there's a, like, if you go back to the slide about the, the invariant function approximations, yeah. So yeah, this one. So the, the case where you are not learning the sort of the relevant function, that's the where you're not able to do it, even if you have, maybe you are predicting an, or the, the thing that you're predicting is intrinsically an equivariant property. Yeah. Since then that, that would fall into that category. Yeah, so that's certainly one part of it. It could also be that like maybe for some reason um, you needed to make some prediction and it really required a cross product in mm -hmm. order for you to make that prediction. Um, once you're only dealing with invariant interactions, there's really no way to do that. Um, so you might, maybe you need like a pseudo scalar or something. Um, something that like maybe you're predicting something about chirality, but maybe your none of your invariants are sensitive to chirality, uh, right. and so this might be an issue. Now, some folks might argue, well, a pseudoscalar is not an invariant object; it's it's equivariant because it it does change under parity. Um, but there exist examples for which it's very helpful to have had equivariant interactions and not just the invariants, but um, or to derive your invariance. And so it, there, there comes to be kind of a trade-off between do you just go with an equivariant network or do you really, really need to make sure you have all the invariance you need um, to guarantee that you can fit the function? Right. And then you, you said something about the efficiency. So I'm a bit curious about this. So um, yeah. are, th are there some examples of, of the if efficiency? So using equivariant neural networks that the efficiency is actually uh, improved? Yes, so um, I'll have some slides later specifically about the data efficiency between invariant and equivariant methods. So I think that will address your question. Great, thanks. There's also a question about activation functions, but maybe you'll also address this later. Or... I actually don't discuss activation function explicitly in this talk just because it's a little nuanced, but I'm, I'm happy to just say, um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about it later, but our activation function, so activation functions typically are element-wise. So if I have a vector and I have like five elements in my vector, I apply the nonlinearity to each um, element uh, one at a time. You can't do that here. You need to actually have equivariant activation functions. It is not difficult to build equivariant activation functions, but you do need to be careful. You have to make sure it's correct. Um, and so that is another thing that does have to change in, in equivariant neural networks. Great. Okay. I think that answers both questions that this, uh, and then there's a, a question from, again, from Shana Vaz about the water mo mo molecule example. The 3D yeah. structure position of the molecule represents different information than the full Hamiltonian. Do you mean that the model learns the corresponding operations on the Hamiltonian that the rotation in 3D leads to? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So, so indeed, uh, so if I go back to that example, um, 
basically it's saying that if I had a model where I put in the water molecule in a particular orientation and then I predict it Hamiltonian, if I rotate the water molecule, the output Hamiltonian will also rotate. But in our networks, there are no rotations in the network. We only use rotations when testing the model, testing that we can either rotate the inputs or rotate the outputs and it's equivalent. That's the only time we use rotations. Um, the way that equivariance is achieved is purely through basically ensuring our multiplication operations and our nonlinearities um, basically preserve um, the structure of, of the Euclidean symmetry group, which I'll go into a little bit more detail later. Great, thanks. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Okay, all right, yes. So we've used Euclidean neural networks to build data efficient and scalable models of physical processes. A very, very important part of this was creating software that allowed us to easily articulate uh, new architectures uh, and be able to actually scale calculations. And so um, a package that uh, Mario Geiger and myself have put a lot of love into. Mario Geiger is our uh, benevolent dictator for life. So he's the one who uh, is in charge of what uh, the trajectory of the package and he does an amazing job. Um, this package basically has all the mathematical primitives and as well as some of the like neural network primitives that you know you can't just use a convolution from PyTorch. You can't just use a, a dense network or a fully connected a layer from, from PyTorch, you, you have to basically have custom operations for all this. And so this is what E3NN allows us to do for the Euclidean group. Uh, so there's a PyTorch version. And also I think Mario would uh, find it very important for me to express to you that there's also a JAX version that is truly very elegant. Um, so this is really kind of at the core at being able to do a lot of these applications. So this is just kind of a roadmap of some of the things that we've been able to do so far. So we've predicted properties of atomic systems, whether it be crystals um, or uh, molecules. And I think other folks have also done proteins. Um, so we have forces and energies and we have things like electronic structure. So charge densities, the Hamiltonian that I showed you earlier, density of states for a more abbreviated version of some of these properties. And then some folks have also been using it for coarse graining. So being able to take um, a very large system of atoms to kind of condense it into um, fewer atoms and then be able to actually kind of super resolution the atoms back. Uh, so it's a generative process um, that also comes from a long history of basically trying to make molecular dynamics more efficient. So this is just kind of a roadmap of some of the things I'll show. So Boris Kaczynski, uh, his group, and especially headed by Simon and Albie and his group have really done amazing things with scaling uh, equivariant models for molecular dynamics. And so to give some context as to the speed with which this field is moving, uh, which I'm always shocked at. Uh, so in December 2022, so just two years ago, the Gordon Bell Prize, which is the Nobel Prize of Supercomputing, went to DeepMD. Uh, which was a team um, comprised of many folks, but even some people at Berkeley National Lab. We were not part of this team, so this is this is uh, but this is what, what they were awarded um, for basically achieving machine learned molecular dynamics with quantum mechanical accuracy um, on a hundred million atoms. And if you're wondering what a hundred million atoms looks like, that is this box right here. So the little dots. This is a um, polycrystalline. A sample of copper, so 50 nanometers by 50 nanometers. And they ran this on Summit, which is a supercomputer with 27,000 GPUs. So truly a, not only a scientific feat, but also an engineering feat. Just one month later, um, Simon folks, including myself, came out with NEQIP. And NEQIP is an equivariant method that is a thousand times more data efficient than DeepMD. So it's more accurate when trained on less data. So when tested on a data set for ice, so just um, solidified water, basically DeepMD needed about a hundred thousand examples, and we only needed we needed a you know a uh, hundred to achieve just comparable uh, as accurate, actually slightly more accurate results. So it just kind of goes to show um, how data efficient these models can be compared to things that maybe don't include symmetry. Then roughly a year later, Allegro came out and that's headed again by Simon and Albion Boris's group. And what this allowed it to do is it kind of switched from a message passing paradigm, if you're familiar with graph neural networks. So instead of a message passing paradigm, it actually has like kind of a fixed cutoff radius. 
so that when you're making a force prediction for a given atom, you're just considering up to some local cutoff. And this allowed basically an equip like network to be scaled to a hundred million atom system on a moderate number of GPUs. So roughly a hundred GPUs. So that's how fast kind of this field of um, machine learned ab initio molecular dynamics is going. And all these codes are open source and Simon and Albie have done just an incredible job um, making these methods uh, capable of just ingesting any data set that you might be interested in and they you know, connect with lamps. Um, so very, very usable code for the community. Um, another thing that we've done that's been really fun, this is with Josh Rackers, formerly at Sandia National Lab, now at Prescient Design, is that we were kind of using these models to uh, ask scientific questions. Now, this is a question that the answer is already known, but we wanted to see how a neural network would approach this problem. And the question was, how nearsighted is water? If I'm going to try and predict charge densities on a water molecule, how far out do I need to see um, before, you know, I'm, I'm basically getting as accurate as I'm going to get. And so what we did is we trained a model on different cluster sizes of water and then tested it on a larger cluster size. So we would have uh, like N water molecules. So maybe like seven, uh, eight, 10, 12, 15, and then we would test on N equals 30. And so we did this for DFT. And this is the error that we're showing here. And then we also did this for CCSD, I think T in parentheses as well. Um, and we can't compute at that high level of theory. It's a very, you know, basically DFT scales as like N to the three for the number of electrons and CCSDT is like N to the seven. Um, so we couldn't run that. But the basic idea is to say, you know, can we actually use our smaller data sets um, in the context of where we know that there are certain cutoffs for effective electron-electron interactions um, to actually say something useful at these larger scales and eventually hoping to scale to something that's biologically relevant. Uh, and so this is a really nice paper kind of showing um, how the models behave and that we could try and get around these questions using a neural network. So this is going back to the idea that in molecular dynamics, one of the ways to make molecular dynamics go faster is to reduce the number of atoms that you're dealing with. So to coarsen your representation. But then ideally what you'd like to do is you'd like to go back to your uh, initial configuration, but because you've lost some degrees of freedom, you really are describing a statistical distribution of where all the atoms might be. So this is work um, led by Rafa gomez Bobarelli's group. And um, the, the people doing the, the very hard work on this paper are Wuji, Minkai, and Chen. And this is a really cool use, a sort of a generative model task that we were using uh, equivariant neural networks for. So I'm just going to check my time. OK, great. Um, this is my proud parent moment. Um, I just started my group at MIT. And so this is the first paper that came out of my group. This is Equiformer, um, led by Elam Yao in my group. And this is an equivariant graph attention transformer. And we wanted to apply, basically see if we could apply attention mechanisms in graphs in an equivariant model to really challenging data sets like the open catalysis project. So in these tasks, we have this sort of metallic uh, surface, this, this um, it's like a heterogeneous catalysis problem. So you have this surface and you have a molecule coming in and you want to calculate kind of the energy of coming to interact with the surface in hopes that that's going to help encourage certain chemical reactions to occur. And so it's a very large data set, very varied. This surface can contain many different types of transition metals. And what was really cool is that Elon was able to demonstrate that his attention mechanism um, does really well with a very lightweight network on this task. So even though ninth might not seem like a great achievement, uh, you have to put it in the context of how completely huge some of these other models are. Um, they're truly gigantic. And additionally, um, Elon's Equiformer model was trained uh, with 10 times less epoch, so it saw the data 10 less times. Um, and part of that is con computational constraints. Um, we only have a very small little cluster for now. Uh, but it, it was really impressive to see that just by a good choice of architecture and, and tuning, um, you could see a much more compact model do very well on a challenging data set. 
And then uh, furthermore, then Elon took Equiformer plus uh, the spherical channel network that um, was, was um, done by Meta. It's a really cool paper. I encourage you to look at it. It's really interesting. It has some not quite equivariant mechanism, but it allows it to go to higher angular frequency and uh, which I'll discuss in more detail later, but a very cool network. And so Elon combined the two to kind of get the best of both worlds and was able to achieve second place um, at the uh, Open Catalysis Challenge for 2022. And he's actually giving his talk later today. Um, this is central time. So around uh, uh, 3.50 central time at the NeurIPS uh, Open Catalysis Challenge um, uh, session. So very excited. Uh, for him on that. And then additionally, it's been really cool to see that Equiformer has actually been picked up by other folks, at least the attention mechanism has, and been applied to other problems. So Equifold came out by Prescient Design and Friends and applies an Equiformer-inspired architecture to the problem of protein folding. And what's very cool about the Equifold model, model is that it has comparable accuracy to AlphaFold, but it doesn't use multi-sequence alignment, and it's much faster. So Equifold might do something in one second that took AlphaFold one hour. And they have, they just published their code recently as well. Um, so very cool stuff going on. It's it's really cool to see how rapidly things, things move in this area. Okay, I'll pause there really quick just to see if there's any questions about some of the applications. Um, and then I'll go on to some of the, the unexpected lessons in the remaining time. Yeah, I wonder if you could comment a bit on on the on the on the attention mechanism that you have in the Equiforma network. Can you because you you mentioned that this was somehow the new thing in, in that can you maybe give a quick rundown of how that works? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just give a very high level kind of description. I don't actually have any slides for that one. I really should ask Elon for his slides. Um, the basic idea, so there exists other equivariant transformer models um, or other equivariant attention models. But what is different about the one that Elon came up with is that it's sort of like more equivariant. It's using more tensor products. It's not um, just using dot products. So a dot product is an equivariant operation, but it is not sort of, again, this outer product notion, this tensor product notion. So Elon's model uses a more general um, tensor product for um, the attention mechanism. And also I think Elon really pared down. It looks very similar to sort of like the original transformers. Um, it's, it's a very simple model. It's, it's probably much easier just to go to the Equiformer paper and, and look at the, um, if I was just showing that diagram, but those are, those are kind of the two things that I think really stand out with Equiformer is its simplicity and the fact that it's really taking equivariance, like it's, it's replacing any operation in a transformer with an equivariant equivalent that's like maximally equivariant. So tensor product, not just dot product. So those are the kind of the two main differences. All right. Okay. Thanks. Great. So this is going to get back to Simon's question about like, well, do we actually know that whether equivariant models are more efficient than invariant models? And so this is something that has kind of emerged out of a lot of these works is that folks are noticing that equivariant models are more data efficient, even when you're predicting an invariant quantity. So you're predicting something like energy. Even then, an equivariant model is more data efficient. And the way that we sort of explore this is um, what you do is that you, you will train many different models, um, but you look at sort of the log of the error of the model on your task and the log of the number of training examples. And what that'll do is you'll roughly see a trend that is linear in log log space for basically what is the error that you achieve for the number of training examples that you include. And as you include more training examples, the model should get better. It should be learning more and more. So as long as your model has enough capacity to learn, um, this error should keep going down as it see, sees more examples. And what we're seeing is that the slope of these linear trends uh, is different for invariant versus equivariant models. And so basically invariant has a slope, but an equivariant has a steeper slope. So it's sort of learning more quickly. Now the offset will be very architecture and task dependent, but we find that the slope is like fairly robust. And these are just some examples. I think there are others at this point, but these are just some examples of seeing this in molecular dynamics for force fields, uh, seeing this for predicting electron densities, where essentially you have sort of one slope and then you have another slope for um, when you sort of turn on additional um, 
equivariant features. So I haven't yet actually discussed the difference between L equals one and L max equals greater than one. That'll be in some future slides. But just in the session, the, the sense that one, you know, L equals zero is invariant, and then anything greater than that is going to be equivariant. So we see that in different tasks, these are more or less robust. And we even see this across sort of different architectures. So this is a very interesting trend. We don't have a um, like formal theoretical statement for why this is. And that's something that I think a lot of the theorists are excited about to, to try and uh, figure out. All right. So I haven't actually told you like nitty gritty, like how this stuff works under the hood. So let's get into that now. So Euclidean neural networks are a combination of neural networks and representation theory. So neural networks uh, essentially are just any, so any machine learned model in general is just some function f with some input x, some learnable parameters w that lead to some output y. So when we really abstract, as long as we're not talking about non-parametric models. And in order to say basically how well is the model doing, we have what we predicted versus what we want. And we have some sort of loss function, in this case, the mean squared error loss, to basically say how well we're doing. Now, what makes neural networks special is that they must be differentiable such that we can update the weights with the following rule. We take the weights that we have, and then we update them in the opposite direction of the gradient with respect to like the loss with respect to every single parameter in the model. And so we update with some learning, um, learning rate eta. And so we kind of just move in the opposite direction. Okay, but what about representation theory? So representation theory is the mathematics of how do things change or transform under some operation or group action as it's more formally known. So if you've ever run into a point group or a space group or selection rules or symmetry allowed in forbidden properties, these come up a lot in chemistry, material science, um, condensed matter physics. So if you ever run into sort of these terms, um, you have encountered rep group representation theory. And what group representation theory tells us is that in order for a neural network to be equivariant or any function to be equivariant it has to satisfy the following property. Um, I have to be able to act with my group. Um, so my set of operations, I have to be able to act on it, either of the inputs or the outputs, and it has to be guaranteed to mean the same thing. It has to give me exactly the same um, result. Now there's a couple details that I'm a little bit sweeping under the rug. So G is the element of Euclidean symmetry. D is how we sort of represent that object acting on X. So if X is a, a three-dimensional vector, then D of G will be sort of your um, familiar three by three rotation matrix. But if the output of F is like the Hamiltonian matrix, uh, then D of G becomes a lot more complicated because now your, uh, the thing that you're acting on um, is, a, is a much higher order object. So it will not just simply be a three by three matrix. It'll be a very high dimensional object that looks pretty different, um, but it still is the representation of the same operation. It's just on a different vector space. Notably, um, I want to emphasize here that the weights do not have a D of G in front of them because uh, traditionally we always assume that those should be scalars so that our weights don't have their own coordinate system to deal with. Uh, and that just ends up being a lot easier. There are circumstances where you might not want this to be the case though. I don't talk about that today, but it's something that I'm actively thinking about. Okay, so what is actually the input to these methods? Well, we input geometry and features on that geometry. So if I have these two point masses, they have a mass and maybe let's say they have a velocity and an acceleration vector. So I have to give basically where are the features in space and what are they? Additionally, I need to tell the model what are these objects? And the basic intuition for that is if the model is going to preserve symmetry, we first need to tell it what's there. Um, so we basically say, okay, well, the first number is gonna be a scalar. The next three numbers are a vector and the next three numbers are a vector. They travel together. This is the thing that's different. Um, things in our network have data types. And so it's not just a number, it's actually, what is this object and how does it transform under rotational symmetry and inversion in our case? So a scalar has zero angular frequency. It does not change under rotation and it is even under inversion. If I basically change from a right-handed to a left-handed coordinate system, it doesn't change. If I have a vector, it has angular frequency one. It rotates at the same rate as my change of coordinate system, but it does flip under inversion. If I kind of invert my coordinate system, my vector will flip. 
Um, so we actually have to categorize our input features in this way. Most of the time, folks are really only inputting scalars and vector features, but you're welcome to always put in things like three by three matrices or higher tensor objects, and the network handles it just fine. So not only are, are, do our inputs need to be categorized in this way, all of the data in the network carries these data types. So they're all geometric tensors. And so geometric tensors are just objects that transform predictably under you know, rotation, translation, inversion, or whatever your group symmetry is. But in our case, for Euclidean symmetry, it's those operations. Um, so this has to be specified. And it's another reason why all of our um, layers have to be custom built because it's not just a number, it is a geometric tensor, and we need to know exactly what these different objects are. But you might be familiar with some of these geometric tensors, um, things that behave like spherical harmonics actually transform as fundamental data types in our networks. So as you can imagine, if we're predicting things like charge densities, which are often expressed in terms of spherical harmonics and, and radial functions, uh, it's a very natural um, way to operate and to predict this data. Um, any questions on that in the meantime, before I discuss specifically how we deal with convolution? So maybe you can, you can highlight, since you didn't point it out directly in the example you gave about the, the irreducible representations, the, the difference between parity and non, so how would that manifest itself here? Yeah. Yeah, so like in, how would that change in the IREP or, or sort of like, why do these things have definite parity? Yeah. So the first question, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so in this case, so we talked about the scalar and the vector. There are also objects like pseudo scalars and pseudo vectors. So if I wanted to classify, like, okay, I look at my hands and I want to say this is not just a hand, which would be an invariant label. I want to say this is my right hand or this is my left hand. Now it turns that hands are actually they're kind of the same object. It's just that one's a right hand and one's a left hand. And that you can define with a, with a pseudo scalar. So a pseudo scalar would be one for my right hand or minus one, but let's say one for my right hand and minus one for my left hand. Um, and so you can actually define parity in that way. Um, additionally, for vectors, we also have pseudo vectors. And so when you actually apply a cross product, so I say, you know, uh, this vector cross this vector, the thing that I get is actually a pseudo vector um, because if I, uh, invert these two vectors. So if I have these two vectors that I'm taking the cross product of and I invert them, <laughs> which is a little bit of a weird operation to show by hand, um, that cross product actually stays the same. And so it does not change under parity. And so that's why we need these two things hanging around um, in order to accommodate things like mirror symmetries and inversion. But it's a very simple group. Parity is a deceptively simple group. Rotations, there's an infinite number of operations. But really, you just take uh, 3D rotations times two operations, one and minus one, and suddenly you get things like pseudoscalars and scalars um, and vectors and pseudo vectors. So it's a, deceptive, it's a deceptively simple group that leads to some very beautiful consequences um, in physical systems. So hopefully that illuminates that a little bit. Definitely. Thanks. There's also a question from Kathleen. I'll just sure. ask her to unmute. Please go ahead. Hi, yes, I think Hi. I am un unmuted now, yes? yes? Okay, great. Okay, uh, so you cannot see me, but you can hear me. So uh, thanks so far for the talk. I have a mathematical question. I am, uh, I'm not really a representation theorist, but close to it. So <laughs> if you think of uh, the set of all possible equivariant layers, yes. so these layers that you're building here with what you call geometric tensors, are you um, doing, are these all possible equivariant layers under the, the groups that you're interested in, or are you uh, constructing a special subset of uh, equivariant layers? Yeah, so great question. So um, I would say our, our tensor product operation is most general. Now, there are some important things that just due to computational costs, uh, we do limit. So typically, you know, if you keep, you know, multiplying like an L equals one feature times itself, eventually you'll get to L equals infinity, but that won't fit in our computer very well. So we typically do have some cutoff. So in that sense, technically it is not most general, but in theory, you could construct that if you had a big enough computer and enough time to wait around. Um, 
There have been other papers published by folks, not us, who um, are, are much more mathematical than me, um, proving the universality of um, several um, combinations of our operations, saying that like if you have an equivariant function, you can universally approximate them using the operations that we include in our networks. That being said, it does not mean that the way we have encoded equivariant operations is necessarily the most efficient. So often there's still a lot of work that we're doing for basically finding shortcuts for what are the most expressive equivariant operations for different domains. So that's still very much an open question. But in principle, in theory, the operations that we do include in our networks are guaranteed to be universal. Um, but universality doesn't mean useful or practical. Um, so that's why we rely on actually applying these methods to real systems. And we're finding that they're very effective, but I, I will guarantee you 100% there are operations that are really effective that we've yet to you know, figure out or, or include in these models. I think that answers quite well. I think we can move on, thanks. Great. So just a thing about convolution. So one of the ways that we learn complex descriptions of our system or learn really robust features is through sort of a convolution mechanism, which you can adapt in any which way, um, but I think it's worth, worth uh, spelling out how to do it. So just in a standard image convolution for reference, you basically have this filter that you slide over, but the filter, it depends on your choice of coordinate system. It's typically oriented. So that's not gonna work for us because we wanna be equivariant. Uh, there's one additional change we want to make. So in this talk, I've been focusing on atomistic systems. You can certainly apply this to voxel data or mesh data or anything that you like. We've been focusing on atomic systems. So in that case, um, instead of dealing with a binned filter, so like kind of a filter that has uh, discrete um, regions, we actually go back to the continuous form of the convolution. So our function, our filter function W is a continuous function of the relative distance between a convolution center and its neighbor. Um, but basically th this is the, the traditional way of doing it. And this is like the computer vision way of doing it. Um, so they are like equivalent. This is just the discrete form. So we go back to this um, continuous form. And then furthermore, the spherical harmonics appear once again, uh, we're basically constrained in our filters, although it's still very expressive, that we are allowed to learn radial functions, but the angular part of our filter it must be the spherical harmonics. Um, and then when we actually go about interacting sort of what we're convolving over with the filter, we again use our geometric tensor product. Um, and then for those of you who took quantum mechanics and used Griffiths, uh, for learning quantum mechanics, you might remember this table of Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. And that is in fact what's under the hood in all of our tensor product operations is that you multiply two things together. There's a set of coefficients that allow you to re-express it in this sort of more um, compact, irreducible representation basis, which is a choice. It's a, it's a choice for how we do this. We could keep everything in terms of Cartesian tensors or something, but we find that this irreducible basis, the same basis that transforms and, uh, like the spherical harmonics um, to be much more convenient and compact. So let me look at the time. Okay, I think we still have a little bit more time. So yeah. I'll go ahead. Yeah, great. And I'll, I'll launch into, so this is one of my favorite things to talk about in these networks, but it takes a bit of buildup to get there. And um, something that we really surprised us when, when we were starting to build these networks is that they behave like physical systems in some specific ways. So if you have a symmetry preserving network, Euclidean or otherwise, it turns out that the outputs have to have equal or higher symmetry than the inputs. And this actually stems from a very uh, well-loved law uh, in physics that I was articulated in 1894 by Pierre Curie. Maybe, I'm sure other people also thought about it, but he put it down on paper in a nice way in French, but I'll read it in English because I don't speak French. Um, basically, when uh, effects uh, have certain asymmetry, this asymmetry must originate from the causes that gave rise to them. Basically saying asymmetry just can't come out of nowhere. It has to come from something. Um, and to demonstrate that our models have the same property, even when not trained, I have the following example. So I'm going to give three randomly initialized Euclidean neural networks an input geometry of a tetrahedron and just maybe a simple scalar on each node of the tetrahedron saying, I'm a point, I exist. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with an octahedron. 
And what I've asked the model to do is I've asked the model to output um, a set of irreducible representations, a set of um, values that are corresponding to coefficients of these spherical harmonics. So the same orbitals that I've been showing you, it's going to output a number, and each number will correspond to a specific function. And then we're basically plotting the linear combination of those spherical harmonics. And it relates to these really pretty shapes. And what I want you to notice is that each of these shapes has the same symmetry as the tetrahedron. It has the same rotational symmetries if you rotate through the faces or if you mirror certain planes. Um, it has the same symmetry. Same thing for the octahedron. You know, these are the same random models. Uh, this is a different shape, but this shape has octahedral symmetry. The, an octahedron and a cube have the same symmetry. So if this looks like a cube to you. That's right. It totally matches up. Um, and so this was something that, you know, made sense when we realized it, but we didn't intend for this to be there when we made it. So there's a lot of consequences that you sometimes don't intend when you make symmetry equivariant methods. So let me show you a task where this actually comes up as a problem, or it's, it's a feature or a bug, you know, you, you can decide. Uh, we're going to ask the network to take in a rectangle and then learn a vector that displaces the vertices to this square. And then we're going to ask it to do the opposite task single task. We're going to overfit the model to just do this one task. So it should be pretty easy for a neural network, right? Not quite. Okay. So first of all, what are these blobs? These blobs are, again, spherical harmonics. The reason why I'm using spherical harmonics instead of a vector is that I want to show you a distribution of vectors. And it turns out a very elegant way of doing that is to use spherical harmonics. And so what you see here is that if I ask the neural network to take a rectangle and move the points to be a square, no problem. It predicts that, OK, I can learn this distribution of vectors. This is going to be the one that's most probable. We go in this direction. Everything's, everything's great. What is happening over here? It is not doing the task. You know, It doesn't have a blob reaching here. In fact, it has two lobes. Uh, they're half the size. <laughs> what is going on? The network predicts a degenerate outcome. Even though it was trained on one example to go to this rectangle, it basically automatically knows by symmetry there's actually two degenerate solutions to this. And so it predicts the average of the two options. So this plus this divided by two. And so this is really interesting, but it's also very frustrating. You're like, maybe you really wanted to predict that rectangle. So what can you do? Well, in physics, this is actually a well-known thing uh, when dealing with structural phase transitions of crystals. And what we typically do is to describe this symmetry breaking is that we use these things called order parameters. So if I have a high symmetry state, like a square, and I have these two lower degenerate uh, symmetry states, like my rectangle, what I need to do is I need to figure out some order parameter that articulates that I'm choosing a particular direction in this symmetric situation. And it turns out these order parameters are also tensors. They, they are geometric tensors as well. So we did the following. Um, we basically then say, OK, I see that you have a degenerate situation. What information did I need to give you in order for you to be able to pick this rectangle over this rectangle? And so we're going to learn kind of like an, a global environmental parameter, something that um, all of the atoms see. It's not specific to each or each point. Um, you know, how could we, how could we fix this? So we're going to use the same gradient trick that we use to train a neural network, but instead of updating the weights, we're going to update the inputs and allow the inputs to have equivariant features or higher order tensor features that we initialize as zero. We assume, okay, you only have scalar information, but you're going to learn some equivariant features that will allow you to break this symmetry. And so what ends up happening, what's really cool is that you can actually, you can, there's, there's very short little group theory proofs that you can make that shows that the gradients will only update the minimal amount of information it needs to break the symmetry. And so you start off with just a scalar feature, so that can be represented as just a sphere. And then you learn these anisotropies that are essentially stretching in uh, one of the directions. So it's stretching kind of, in this case, along the x direction. It's sort of saying, oh, the x direction is different than the y direction. Those are sort of different in this system. So this is the missing information that we needed to complete this task. And so by learning this order parameter, now the model can actually fit the data. 
And there's a, this looks like maybe a lot of EREPs. There's kind of a zero um, or there's two and four, um, but actually um, you only need one of them. Uh, once you go to lower symmetry, a lot of the EREPs and higher symmetry become effectively the same type of object uh, for in case for folks who are curious. So um, you can apply this to actual systems as well, not just rectangles and squares. So if I have something like a perovskite, which is a very popular crystal structure because it displays a lot of beautiful distortions that give rise to very exotic properties such as um, different magnetic orders, um, ferroelectricity, um, and things like this. So if we want to sort of learn how to distort this object into this object, there's actually six degenerate ways to do this. And what's very cool is that you can attempt this task with a Euclidean neural network, and you'll actually recover that there are six degenerate ways to do that. Even if to your knowledge, there was only one way to do it because your data set only had this one and this one. So it's very cool that by symmetry, it sort of recovers all the degeneracy. And this is very important for when you deal with like larger material systems and um, you'll get domains. So you'll start off with maybe it's a single crystal, but then all these domains will form because there were six equivalent different ways to distort. And so this is a very physical thing that is occurring and is, is good to capture. You can also um, do some kind of fun stuff where depending on what order parameters you allow it to learn, you can actually recover sort of an intermediate output. So if your input is um, this system, so again, this like high symmetry system, and my target output has distortions in this plane and also it's twisting in this plane. Um, depending on how I restrict my order parameters so that let's say I have a pseudo vector order parameter that has a zero Z component, I can keep this distortion and I can mod out this distortion. And so it's basically, these are operations that we traditionally do with group theory, but the way that we do it is very is prescriptive. And what's cool is you're just doing this with gradients. You know, you can use this without looking at a character table or, or a kind of the traditional tools of group theory. Um, so it's just a different way of going about things that's, that's interesting, that is accessible because you have built symmetry into the model. It's just emergent in the model. Can I ask a question to this point? Yeah, yeah. So, so essentially, if I understand this correctly, you can from data discover the relevant order parameters that give rise to certain distortions. So you basically start with an idealized geometry and then you, under certain constraints, you, you fit somehow the, 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 the distorted, distorted structure. And from this, you can get some insights about the order parameters, is that right? That's correct, yeah. And you can actually come up with even more sophisticated training procedures where you can actually have the model um, predict the distribution of order parameters and then give those order parameters to another model. And so that's something we're actively working on. It's a, it's a little bit of a trickier training procedure, but it should definitely be achievable. And I think that is the paradigm in which it'll be most useful is because you want to start off with a high symmetry prototype and say, okay, here's like where I kind of, this is the kind of structure that I want, but where can I go from this? Like what, what's actually going to happen? How is it going to distort in reality? And so I think that's where this, this kind of uh, setup is going to be uh, most useful. Right, thanks. So I guess it could also be used in principle in a certain design. If you know that a certain distortion gives rise to a certain thing, then you can possibly do a, somehow an inverse or try to design a structure to stabilize that distortion or do a modification. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So basically now you have the ability to, to attempt these design problems with gradients instead of doing it in the traditional way with kind of character tables and things like that. And you can you can imagine very elaborate training procedures mm -hmm. uh, with it, so. Yeah. Great, there's also a lengthy question from Shana Vas. I'll ask him to ask it. Have it okay, involved. great. Yeah, I think it's easier. So I was, as I understand, um, we, we want to basically bake in all these uh, equivariant operations in the network so that mm -hmm. if we have a change in coordinate system in the input data, the network knows how to deal with it. Yeah. But I have a question is, is this then, is it then possible to also restrict the output of the network through this process? So let's say the output that you have of the network is a physically motivated object. Let's say it's the density matrix of a quantum state. Yeah. Then you know you have properties of the density matrix, it should be Hermitian. 
like how are these two things different or because I didn't I've never uh, actually read about equivalent networks before so I don't understand the nitty gritties but is it as I understand it's helping you deal with the data like changing the coordinate system of the data but is it also going to help you in restricting the outputs of these networks to something that's physical or has symmetries and things like that? Absolutely, yeah. So in the case of Hermitian matrices, um, in that case, you'll want to deal probably with SU2 or, or you would probably want to deal with a complex representation. So everything I'm showing you here is um, orthogonal, um, uh, orthogonal bases. Um, but yeah, certainly you can, by articulating your outputs as specific geometric tensors, um, that may even have certain symmetry properties under permutation of indices, you can guarantee that your output behaves in the correct way. So for the Hamiltonian matrix, for example, the Hamiltonian matrix um, is a symmetric matrix, but you have to, uh, that's symmetric under exchange of both like the atom index and the bases. So it's a kind of a, you can, we show it as a, as a kind of two index tensor, but really it's four. Um, and so we can actually bake that in that it's going to have exactly those transformation properties that we want. So we don't we can we can ensure that it is a symmetric matrix under that transformation. Um, yeah, so you can bake this stuff right in there if you if you know the properties of your output. And and this baking in is basically is it changing the definition as you said uh, of the convolution you have to do. Uh, the nonlinearities differently. You can't just apply, let's say, the standard nonlinearity. So, is it by changing the operations itself in the network? Or, for example, I have done something like this, which is almost uh, very trivial. It's a projection. So, if you say that your output is a probability distribution, you apply the softmax, right? Then you can just get uh, the sum to zeros, so all the nice properties there. So, if you extend this much further and you say your output is a positive semi-definite Hermitian matrix, you can kind of take a random matrix uh, to make it Hermitian. You just do the matrix plus it's transposed by two and you force the layers in the network that has these properties. And since all of them are auto-differentiable, it just works. But I as I understand, this is not how you do it. It's a more elegant way that you're doing it with this equivariant yeah. thing. So just so in the I example of ha the Hamiltonian matrix, for instance, what, what would yeah. be? Yeah, so I think for, for the original Hamiltonian matrix paper, and this is with folks at TU Berlin, I think we actually just did the, you know, take the matrix, take the half, you know, conjugate it and then and, and, okay. and sum yeah. it. So I think we do that trick, but you don't have to do it that way. And you can do it by controlling the, um, like which, you're, so all of our outputs, in our case, our output is irreducible representations. And so depending on the transformation properties of your, your matrix, so you'll have kind of like the representation that you're used to seeing it in, which usually has multiple indices, but mm -hmm. you can always take those multiple indices and contract them down to a single, single index of irreducible representations. And by doing this, you can actually have complete control over sort of the properties of the, the final matrix. You can imagine taking your irreducible representations, taking that one index object, and then using an inverse tensor product, putting it back as a two index object. Um, and by doing so, you can control its permutation symmetries and all these things. And so this is kind of the, the more elegant way to do it. And it's what we do nowadays. But certainly originally when we were dealing with Hamiltonian Google, yeah, we did the same trick of, of just, um, you know, conjugate and sum and take the average. Um, but now, you know, if you if you really know the transformation properties, you can control it by simply which irreducible output, uh, irreducible representations you output, and then how you use those to construct your final matrix. And we have some we have some like more specific functions for how you go about that change of basis we, that we call reduced tensor product. So it helps you figure out, given certain indices that transform in specific ways, how does that go to a single index of irreducible representations, and how do you go back? So what is the transformation between those? So that's a lengthy, <laughs> a lengthy yeah. explanation. Oh, sorry, there. yeah, but this is exactly what I wanted to understand. Like, is there something more elegant than the? Now it feels very really crude, just you know, uh, a plus a dagger by two. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean it gets the job done too. There's, there's a you know, it's there's a really sense of practicality. Yeah. <laughs> it's very it's efficient. Really great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wanted to see something more general because then extending this to arbitrary problems. So now you, let's say you have a CPTP completely positive trace preserving map, then it's not so simple. What do you do with a matrix that's not CPTP to make it CPTP? Like there are, of course, you can do a lot of things, but they become costly. So the most elegant way is 
sometimes not working uh, or the most simplest way so uh, is there a systematic way that's what i wanted to understand but yeah so i think the short answer is yes and for the details i would probably need to show you the specific specific function we have implemented in e3 and n called reduced I, I, I will have a look definitely thank you very yeah much. it's a it's a very cool function um it's it's not uh it's a little it's a bit slow it's faster in jacks the Jax version is much much faster. Yeah, um, I'm all up for Jax. Like, I, it's so it, I'm <laughs> very happy to take a look. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. Great. Okay, I think there's there's one question maybe that we can save to the end that is about. Sure. The, yeah, the I, I have like like yeah. three more slides. So, um, I really appreciate all these questions. These these are great questions. Um, okay, so this is sort of you know going back to this whole degeneracy thing. So instead of just doing gradients back to these order parameters, although there's multiple ways to do that even, um, what if we just made our outputs more useful? Because the, the issue here is that, okay, we really want, th these outputs are not very useful because it's like a per atom prediction, half the time I go this way, half the time I go that way. But we really only want either this rectangle or this rectangle, we don't want something like this. Uh, so the issue here is that these per atom predictions have traced out the correlation with the other atoms. So one way to fix this, it's not the only way to fix this, but I think it's a better way to visualize, is that you can actually um, maintain this correlation and predict higher order tensors that include not just like, okay, here is my state of, you know, I'm either in rectangle one or I'm rectangle two, but you can actually compute tensor products of that operation to construct higher moments of that distribution of solutions and use that to back out individual degenerate possibilities. I'm kind of going quickly on this one as this is kind of something that we're working on right now that I hope to maybe you know come back and tell you guys more about. But these are things that we're talking about. And where this comes up is like, let's say you want to do a generative model and you want to lay down patterns at a time and not just single points. Or maybe you want to learn hierarchical representations of physical systems. We kind of showed how to do that for coarse graining, but that was under very specific circumstances. So how do we generalize that? Uh, so these are sorts of the things that we're thinking about and dealing with these higher correlation objects and whether it's better to deal with that in the outputs or the inputs or what's computationally efficient because we want at the end of the day for it to be practical uh, as well as expressive. Um, so I'm going to leave this up here as my takeaways and I'm happy to take more questions. Thank you for a very nice talk. It's a very great sort of pedagogical rundown of the of all your work and also the, the sort of the theoretical background without being I mean, it's very easy to get caught into the to the <laughs> very technical group theory when you when you present this stuff but you made it in a very lucid way thank you very much you. i think uh, so there was one question that was somewhat of hanging from the previous slide which was about the that you use uh, there's a lot of you introduce a lot of new hyperparameter choices when you when you when you move oh, into yeah. this sort of like when you when as soon as you de depart from traditional methods you you always introduce some other hyperparameters so there's one question about what what you can do to avoid misspecifying the IREPs that you use and and whether there's this sort of systematic way you can learn the IREPs you need from the data yeah um, it's a great question. It's an open question. Um, right now, we're mostly throttled by computation. So basically, it's the trade off. Our tensor product operations, although in JAX, it's much faster. Everything is faster in JAX, is what Mario has taught me. Um, <laughs> so our tensor product operation is not as optimized as matrix matrix multiplication in, you know, PyTorch or, or, or TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. um, part of that's because uh, a lot of people use matrix matrix multiplication and not as many people use tensor products. So part of that is just a software engineering challenge or an optimization challenge. Mm. Um, so we are not going up to the L's that we would like. What we have seen is that going up to higher L typically gets you better results. And so um, this is something that we've even seen in the past few months. Like, so spherical channel network is a really interesting model because it's approximately equivariant, but the reason they do it is so that they can get to higher L. Um, and they do it in a very clever way. And what I think like one of the reasons why they're so well performing is because they are dealing with higher, like higher IREP order objects. Effectively, that's computing a more complex polynomial sooner in the network. And so you don't need to go as deep to kind of have these richer um, features. 
So what we're finding is that definitely having equivariance is better than just invariance for a lot of practical tasks. That doesn't mean that there doesn't exist some really amazing invariant model that can compete with equivariance. Like we just haven't seen one um, in practice, but it's to be shown whether that is just a practical observation or whether there are some theory reasons for why we're seeing this. Um, so we do find that if you can afford it, parity is really great to include as well, mm -hmm. especially depending on what you're predicting. Sometimes it's like completely necessary, uh, depending, like if you really want to predict outputs that are chiral, you really need a pseudoscaler around. Um, for coarse graining, this ended up being super important using pseudoscalers. Um, other than that, it is a, it's a bit of guess and check right now, sadly, and uh, it's a balance between higher L and higher fidelity and more expressive components and can this fit on the GPU. So there is that current trade-off that I'm hoping will become less of an issue fairly soon. So yeah, I think that's, a, that's a good, uh, that's a good way to look at it. I think the, the main constraints that we have as, as I see it also is, is exactly and what are the, what are the architectures that we can practically explore right now, right? That's the memory limitations and the, 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 the GPU cycle limitations that these model introduce with the tensor products. So and there's another there's question about- Software infrastructure limitations, I think, because right. like, these software infrastructures have enabled so much, but they are also tailored for certain things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, I think the software infrastructure, the hardware infrastructure, and also just kind of how people think about neural networks all influence what is easy and what is hard to do. Absolutely. So there's a question about the phys uh, about physical constraints generally in ML. So there's, of course, E3 and N, which is the building things into the architecture directly. And then there's the sort of the other way, sort of the Lagrangian way of inc incorporating constraints into a loss function and optimizing it in this way. There's some uh, lady is uh, wondering about if you could comment a bit on these two different uh, approaches and maybe when one is applicable and when is one is not so applicable. Yeah, I mean, I think when you have a look, like if you're, especially for dynamical systems, I mean, things like Hamiltonian networks um, or neural ODEs, I mean, certainly if, if your system is described by like a differential equation, um, that's a great thing to take advantage of. Everything I showed here, we're not doing really any time steps. I mean, we're doing time steps in the sense that we're doing molecular dynamics, but we're in the approximation of like, you move an infinitesimal amount in time and space. Um, so I think all of that infrastructure that, you know, taking everything we know about Lagrangian mechanics and Hamiltonian mechanics um, is great to take advantage of. And it really just depends on what are you trying to model in our case for like, we, we know our Hamiltonian, it's the many body Schrodinger equation. We just, we do not know how to solve it. And so for us, um, you know, there are, there's some really amazing works like a uh, polynet Fermi net. And I think there was a recent extension um, for, you know, figuring out wave function type things. And I think that has some very beautiful with the backflow algorithm it has like some, some beautiful uh, physics informed architecture aspects in it. Um, yeah, so I mean, you, you should grab it, whatever makes sense for your problem. Uh, in my case of dealing with um, quantum mechanical data that we get from calculating on supercomputers, um, it doesn't seem super amenable to, to using some of these priors just because our Hamiltonian <laughs> we know is just not easily solvable. Um, but maybe maybe I'm just mis misinformed on that. So, um, but yeah, I think all these techniques are ones we should have in our arsenal because um, science is hard. So, yeah. All right, thanks, uh, Tess. I think we'll we'll stop. Oh, there's one, maybe one last question here. In the if you have time, that is, we are running over. It's okay. Uh, is the expressivity of the neural network limited by using only the radial function? I guess not, right? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the question is kind of, it, it kind of goes to like, where are the parameters hiding in our network? So in the case of convolutions, indeed they're in the radial functions, but there are also, um, there are actually also weights in our tensor products. Um, so basically like, let's say I have two vectors and two vectors and I'm multiplying them. Now these two vectors will lead to a three by three matrix. These two vectors will lead to a three by three matrix. And so will, you know, this vector and this vector. So there's like, I have four different three by three matrices I get out of this tensor product. 
And I can learn weights for which of these four matrices are more or less important. You know, do I want to add a, a positive or negative weight to these? And so there's also weights in there. So we're kind of selecting out which parts of the tensile product are more or less important. Um, you can actually hypothetically also use this for pruning, which would be really appealing because these operations can get quite pricey uh, for larger, uh, larger IREP objects. But that's another place where our parameters are hiding. Okay, so thank you, Tess. I think we'll end it here. And uh, yeah, thanks again for, for coming. It was a pleasure to have you. And uh, next time we'll have to invite you to Sweden. So yeah, I'm always up for coming to visit you guys in Sweden. Um, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for the amazing questions. It was super fun to engage with you. And uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful break. Thank you. <laughs>